One quick note, Foxy will be back in front of the camera with us. He has been very busy lately with a whole bunch of other amazing artistic projects that you can follow. Foxy, you have your own Facebook page, right? I do have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash Foxy has a posse. There you go. That sounded pretty clever when you came up with it, huh? Yeah, I had some help with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! But uh, you don't want to see me without my uh, my stage makeup. No, though. you don't. <laughs> it's actually quite feral. Um, <laughs> no, so he'll be back next week. That's cool. Because in the meantime, we got all these great comics to lock us down. So coming out less than a month ago. Oh, we're on the top, the top five now. Oh wait! Hey. Oh, the, this whoa! Is the top five. <laughs> Diving right in. <laughs> So, uh, if you experienced this book on the third go-around, coming out less than a month ago, was non-player issue number one, and Hot on its Heels is non-player issue number two. Um, if you happen to be the sad sap that bought it on the first printing, it has been an issue number two four years in the making. <laughs> Don't worry, it didn't disappoint. On the bright side, your issue number one is worth a lot of money. Maybe. No, it is. Is it? First print. Yeah, you can turn that around right now. Right on. Go and do that after the show. So, Non-player number two coming in on number five this week. Um, it's awesome. Everybody that has picked up this book immediately came back for issue number two, and there's not a bad thing to say about it. I mean, Nate Simpson crushes the story and the art. It's awesome. So it was worth the one month wait for us newcomers? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had no problem waiting the, the normal amount of time. Although it was funny, some people today were like, oh my god, it came out so quick. And I was like, well, they only had four years to get it together. <laughs> It'd be really unfortunate if you had any sort of delays at this point. Um, on the other side of things, books that are coming out really, really quickly, Secret Wars issue number three. Seriously, third issue in one month's time. Yeah, it's been crazy. But I'm not complaining because it was totally awesome. This one, um, we finally get to see what happened to the heroes of Earth Ultimate and the 616. I don't remember what the Ultimate unit universe is. 1610. Yeah, that's complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I get it, 616 and 1610, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Well, anyway. That's great. Yes. Uh, as is Secret Wars. Oh, my gosh. God Doom is my God Doom. Right? I, if that was a real church, I would participate in it. Only if I got a face mask, though. He, uh, he's a man of the people, for real. He is, like, and they address it in this entire issue, like, why, why, why is it Doom that's allowed to be God and not, say, like, a hero like Captain America or Doctor Strange or something like that? Like, why does it have to be Doom? It was really good. And as Fox and I were discussing before the show, I mean, in any comic you pick up, subjects of Doom, always big Doom fans... Yeah. It's interesting to see the whole world be a Doom fan now. Latverians love Doom. Yeah. So. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which brings us to our number three, which is finishing its first arc. This is the final issue of its first arc. And there's some major changes at the end of the book, which made me really excited for the second volume to come out whenever that comes out. But we are talking about the Autumn Lands, Tooth and Claw, issue number six. Uh, wow. Talk about climactic. All animals were harmed in the making of this book. Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling it was going to go that way. <laughs> nobody nobody comes out on top of this one. It's bad for everybody. Um, but it was amazing. It was awesome. Ben Dewey's art, Jordi Belair's colors continue to just like every other panel. I have to stop and remember that I'm not supposed to drool on my comics. So. <laughs> that, di that diminishes the value. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, it does. Um, but no. Seriously, if you've waited this long to read Autumn Lands, wait another month to pick up the paperback. I don't know what to tell you. You're missing Yeah, I don't know why you're... <laughs> what, what are you waiting for? If you enjoyed Age of Ultron, that movie wouldn't have happened without Kurt Busiek's contributions to Avengers over the years, so con true. consider what you're doing. Yes. And if you didn't me? like Age of Ultron, this is nothing like Age of Ultron. You should read it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, Foxy. All right, coming in at number two, it actually was a number one until I read number one, and then this book had to become number two. But I called this one as a number one a long time ago. Yo, boom! It's gonna be number boom, one. Number one. <laughs> um, because there are no words in it to confuse me uh, or to make me angry. There is nothing but amazing dinosaurs because it's Age of Reptiles. The uh, what is this? Ancient Egyptia. 
Yeah, that's this is uh, I think the third volume in the Age of Reptiles oh series. Oh my god, I missed a volume somewhere. I only have one of them. Oh no. So I thought maybe this was two. No. This is, is at least the third. At least the third. Unless I've missed one and it's the fourth. Now who's a fool? <laughs> no, Age of Reptiles is amazing. Um, it's a, it's incredible the characterization of each of these dinosaurs. Like by the end of the issue, you like know their thoughts. You feel what they feel. Like they're hungry, you're hungry. But they never say a word. I mean, maybe there's a squawk. I think that's about as close as you get to dialogue. But this one was really awesome. It's all about dinosaurs that would have like existed along uh, the Mediterranean Sea and in Africa. So, really cool. And coming in at number one this week. It's been a really long time since I had a book I could really root for. He's known for Starman. Which is one of Age your guy. favorites. This is one of my favorites. It is one of my favorites. Well, it was a long time ago, though. What have you done for me lately, James Robinson? The answer is... Uh, boy, number one. Um, it's Hunter S. Thompson meets Flash Gordon. It's James Robinson appearing as James Robinson <laughs> and Greg Hinkle appearing as Greg Hinkle as they attempt to get an assignment from Image Comics to reinvent, reboot the Golden Age hero Airboy, who I know nothing about. I've never heard of him before. Um, but yeah, so in the midst of a drug and alcohol induced bender, their character creation, Airboy, walks off the page and begins to interact with them. And that is where our story begins. It's incredibly funny. In fact, some yeah. of the best and brightest minds in comics are talking about Airboy right now, so I'm just gonna read you what they said about it. Matt Fraction has this very lengthy summary of the book. He says, Airboy is remarkable. Uh, Brian K. Vaughn has to say this about it. Airboy is the best thing James Robinson has ever done, thanks in no small part to the outstanding work of Greg Hinkle. As insanely imaginative, imaginative as it is cringe-inducingly honest, this is mandatory reading. And Jeff Lemire says, profane, disgusting, and utterly brilliant. So, if you're looking for something that's gonna smack of realism, I mean, it's awesome. The opening scene is a conversation between a washed up James Robinson, and Eric Stevenson, editor of uh, Image Comics, not washed up, having a conversation about how James Robinson is washed up and needs a fresh book to work on. It's great. So aware of itself. Super meta. Go and get it. It's obviously number one for a reason. Do not let your children open this book. No. Unless you're okay with your children looking at uh, the human anatomy and all of its <laughs> well-endowed glory. <laughs> If you let your kids watch Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, they can read this book. If yeah. not, don't let them read the book. <laughs> Simple as that. Or if they've seen 300, they can read the book. There you go. Man. Uh, well, that's going to do it for our top five. There is one more thing we have to talk about before we go, though. Graphic novels. Actually, two things we have to talk about before we go. So, I read a, a few DC books this week. They weren't bad. But the main thing I paid attention to was DC was doing this new thing with, like, the split... Uh, Split page ads? The Twix ad. The Twix ad. Actually, way less annoying than a full page ad. Still completely skippable. It didn't... <laughs> my eyes were not drawn to the Twix ad at all. Completely glossed over it. But it was cool, because you just read right across the top of the page. You like this page read, and then this page read. So you actually think it's less offensive than a full page ad? I find all ads in my comics to be offensive, but this was no more or less offensive than a full page ad. Huh. Like, it didn't change my reading pleasure whatsoever. Well, the internet disagrees, sir. The internet often says things that are stupid and ignorant. That's true. <laughs> we disagree with the internet all the time. We are on the internet. That's it's We're one of those uh, dissenting voices. <laughs> Why are we so ignorant? No, I don't know. Get it together, us. I don't know what people, th like, I don't know what people's experiences of it was. I don't know if they were like, oh my god, I can't figure out what panel to read next, or the Twix bar. <laughs> no, like, it was fine. It was an ad. I ignored it. It's what I do with all ads. I think what bothers me about it is the spirit of it. Because the we know... aspect of it? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a blatant cash grab because they think they're going to like fool us into reading an ad that we otherwise wouldn't. And maybe right. there's statistics that support that or something. But ultimately, the motivations behind it are what's ugly. On the page, it doesn't do much but different. You know? Yeah, I mean, the motivation behind all ads in comics are ugly. So I think just like movies, they should put them like the first three pages. There you go. There's your ads. Or the last three pages. There's your ads. And that's how they do it on a lot of comics, like a lot of the, not Marvel or DC, but many comics yeah. have I all mean, the ads at the back. Even run ads in it. And if they do, it's like in-house ads, yeah. but they're all at the back. They're not mid-comic. Right. 
Yeah, so I mean, it was no less disruptive than like turning the page and instead of seeing like the next page of art, seeing like a giant advertisement. Now that that rant's out of the way, I got your back, DC. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Only when it comes to the Twix ad. <laughs> From Dark Horse Books, this graphic novel. Uh, if you like mythology, this book is going to be right up your alley. If you've always thought mythology could, you know, use a little injection of, you know, cocaine or something, this book is also going to be good. Sorry. Cocaine. Coming back to the going, going air boy was like 88 pages of cocaine. So <laughs> I think it was only 32, but whatever. Um, no, check out David Rubin. Hero, Dark Horse, hardcover, graphic novel of the week. Words, comics, pictures. Ad. Bam! <laughs> Twix. DC. I think it should have been a Kit Kat ad, because I'm going to be like, I need a break from this garbage. <laughs> it should come with a Kit Kat. Yeah. Like, in the comic, so that you, when you get to it, you can eat it, and then resume the comic. You, just, you unwrap it, and it's just a melty... Yeah, melty it's Kit -Kat. like a little Kit Kat sample. Yeah, you just lick the page. Get the Kit Kat goodness off of it. Send all royalties to Max, care of Astro Zombies. <laughs> I'll share with Foxy, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'll get mine. I'll get my piece. Uh, we will be back here uh, next week to talk about more comics and hopefully not Twix ads. But you never know. Until next time, stay frosty. Eat a Twix. Give me a break. Give